I'm Connor Rebush, and if you are interested in the finer points of face punching, you've come to the right place. This is Heavy Hands. Welcome to Heavy Hands. I'm Connor Rebush. With me is Patrick Wyman. Uh, I don't know why I've adopted this listless tone, but I guess that's the note we're starting today's show it's, on. Uh, it's the listless tone you need knowing that we now have like three weeks off of, off from the UFC, thanks to uh, BJ Penn's timely rib injury. Sure, yeah. I, I almost think the UFC, uh, they got me hooked. Like I think I think last year I would have been psyched to have three weeks off, and now I don't really feel completely psyched. It's a mix of emotions now. Uh, you know, before I would have been like, "Oh, thank God, a rest." Now I'm so inured to the schedule that it's just um, it seems really weird to have three whole weeks off. That's how they get you. You are a uh, you are an MMA addict at this point. They've that's got right. and like that's a, and it doesn't. But see, that's that's the thing. It doesn't even matter who's fighting anymore that's exactly the point of these fox sports one shows is like you just know that you're going to tune in on saturday night and there will be fights on on the contrary i think it's because now i actually do know who's fighting because i do sure dog previews and i've seen most of the guys that i i didn't that were came in in the big influx of new signees i think now that i actually know who they are i can actually get invested before the card because I, I i would always be down for just watching fights no matter who it was if i had nothing else to do but now I actually know who's fighting almost every weekend. Uh, and, and I certainly know who's fighting before each weekend happens because I will have researched all the bouts. So I think it's because I work the schedule that has made the schedule more, has endeared the schedule to me, you know? Hmm, that's a fair point. See, I feel the opposite way. Like, because <laughs> I've been covering every single fight for so long, I... Uh, it has made me less inclined to care sure. about any individual one. But then alternatively, I can always be like, oh, there are fights this Saturday. Yeah, I know who's fighting, but I don't sure. really care. Nothing you know? really compares happening in MMA until December. Nothing compares to Ward Kovalev, though. That is the fight of the uh, rest of the year for me until, I guess, until McGregor Alvarez. I'd say I'm more excited for Ward Kovalev than I am McGregor Alvarez. I think it means more. So. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. I mean, the because... The idea, uh, like, you know that Conor McGregor will probably have another big fight, unless the rumors about him retiring after this are true, which I kind of doubt. Unless McGregor retires after Eddie Alvarez, you know that McGregor is going to have another big fight. You don't know the next time Ward and Kovalev are going to be in really big fights. Yeah, well, that's the story on boxing versus MMA, right? The boxing world, because the fighters have more power and there's more negotiating and everything— um, and everybody protects their records or has the power to protect their records, like I'm sure MMA fighters would if they could, the events feel bigger because everything marinates. And in MMA, the events feel smaller, but there are more good fights happening all the time. So um, despite the fact that there are more boxes in the world than MMA fighters, you get stacked cards all the time with the UFC and with other organizations as well. But um, that is still, like, there's a trade-off there. Ward Kovalev is going to be amazing. And even if it isn't amazing, the lead-up to it will be fun and amazing. And the tension during it will be fun and amazing. You know, like, there's always a Mayweather-Pacquiao chance where it doesn't live up to the hype. But I still can't say I was not – I didn't have a good time watching Mayweather-Pacquiao. I was certainly on the edge of my seat the whole time. And uh, speaking of that, because we're not just going to waffle about fighting theory all day on this episode – um, I was certainly on the edge of my seat more than I expected to be watching Dan Henderson versus Michael Bisping. Um, and uh, before we get into talking about that fight, Pat, uh, we should probably say that we kind of thought that the theme of today's show would be um, career stages, career evolutions for fighters. A lot of fighters kind of go through these phases of how they fight what they've picked up from certain amounts of experience and all that. And uh, on last week's episode, we talked about old men, basically, in MMA, um, experienced vets and what the advantages of that are. And now we're not going to ta be talking about prime so much as we are going to be talking about the distinct phases that a fighter's experience has put him through 
as he uh, marches down the path of his career. And then at the end of the show today, we're going to give a little bit of a technical breakdown tribute to the late, great Aaron Pryor, who passed away just a couple days ago. Of course, being a Cincinnati and myself, I cannot pass up the chance to commemorate one of my all-time favorite fighters and certainly uh, probably the second greatest boxer ever to come out of Cincinnati after uh, Ezra Charles, who is one of the five greatest boxers of all time. So Aaron Pryor will be missed, but we will get a chance to uh, commemorate him a little bit later today. Before that, let's talk about Hendo and Bisping. Pat, overall feeling going into the fight, were you excited or did you become excited over the course of the bout? Uh, I became excited over the course of the fight. Actually, I would say as they were, as everything was uh, leading up to the fight, like in the, like as they were walking out and as they were being announced, I'm like, oh, okay, I can get behind this. Sure. Like, but it took me until that point beforehand. I was not that interested in the fight at we, all. We, I thought it was kind of a farce. We were on kind um, of two opposite sides of the fence on this one. Cause I was like, yeah, it's a farce, but I'm cool with it. And I, so I actually was a little excited. Um, and you were totally unsupportive of the idea of a 46-year-old, 14-ranked middleweight getting a shot at uh, a champion. Yeah, I, I thought that that was farcical. And even after the fact, I still think it's farcical. But uh, the fight itself turned out to be a barn burner. And I think that this is one of the ways in which these guys are just, like, great matchups for each other. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that if you had taken somebody who wasn't Dan Henderson, uh, I, I don't know what I'm getting at there. I, I think that, like... There are were, there are higher ranked fighters in the UFC that Michael Bisping would not have struggled with that much. Yeah. Oh, I agree. Yeah. If you've taken somebody else around Dan Henderson's ranking or a little higher, somebody else below the top, you know, the, the big four in the middleweight division right now, somebody who isn't Weidman, Jacare, um, Romero, or Souza, then I think Michael Bisping would have probably had an easier time with them. Dan Henderson, I think, is it is I won't even say these guys match up great together, although in this sense they did. I will say that I think Dan Henderson is a bad matchup for Michael Bisping. And that it didn't really um dawn on me how bad of a matchup he still might be, no matter how uh desiccated by you know, by time and age and everything, wear and tear, that Dan Henderson could still be a really bad matchup for Michael Bisping. And I, I think he proved that he was. And it turned out that it was like, I, I said um, repeatedly on last week's episode, I did two articles about it. I talked about Shogun Henderson one being the last great fight of Dan Henderson's career. And given this matchup, it turns out I was wrong because this is the last great fight of Dan Henderson's career um, officially because he seems to be done for good. And it was a phenomenal performance, and I don't think it would have been had he fought anybody else holding that belt, because I just think he has Michael Bisping's number in a way that nobody else really does. Yeah, and he's had Michael Bisping's number in different ways in their two different fights. Yes. You yes. know, like, even though, like, I didn't, I, I'll get this out of the way right now. I thought that Michael Bisping won the fight. I thought 48-47, even 49-46, especially after rewatching the second round. Like, Henderson landed three strikes to Bisping's yeah. head all round. Yeah. One of them was a knockdown, but he didn't do anything with the knockdown. Like, I would go, like, going back, I would rescore the second round for, for Bisping. So, 49-46. Uh, Bisping on my card, 48-47 at the very worst. I think scoring it for Henderson is kind of crazy. Yeah, I had um, a 48-47. I could see the 49-46, but I thought because it was such a devastating punch that landed and it, he seemed to hurt Bisping more than the one in the first round, I can see giving that second round to Hendo. But I, I don't see what he really did to win the fight after that. Yeah, so getting getting that out of the way, and I'm sure people will say angry things to us because people have been saying angry things about this online for, for quite a can't, while now. can't have a good fight these days without everyone being upset that it happened, can you, Pat? No, which is just crazy. It's like at some point, and maybe this is because we work in the business, after a little while, I stop giving a shit. Like, you're not oh, going to yeah. get me angry about anything except for the utmost robbery, like uh, Sanchez-Pearson-style robbery. Um, for for longer than like 15 minutes i just after a certain point i don't care like yeah. there's because there's going to be more fights and even then there's i'm gonna not going to be fights. angry about it i'm just going to bring it up later <laughs> you know like i'll get mm -hmm. over it pretty quickly i'll just keep bringing up something like pearson sanchez this is like it's going to go down for me as a really good fight more than anything yeah exactly i mean like it's hard to get invested in in that continual outrage machine for me um but okay so there were a couple of really interesting things here. First of all, I think Henderson had the perfect game plan yep. um, for how to for how to deal with Bisping. And I think that 
Henderson's game plan managed to take the sting off of Bisping's plan in the later rounds. So basically, Henderson's plan was to sit back and counter. Bisping's plan was to wear Henderson out early. And then in the later rounds, as he did to Anderson Silva and Talis Laites and uh, uh, and numerous other guys that he's fought in long fights in, in recent years, to turn it up in the later rounds, to sit down, start sitting down on his punches really in the third, fourth, fifth round and not just pile up volume, but, act, but pile up damage. Mm-hmm in those cases. But because Henderson's right hand on the on the counter was so powerful and so effective, uh, Bisping, even though he was throwing the same kind of volume he normally would, was never comfortable enough to sit down and really dig into his shots the way that he has in recent years. Yeah, he so, started to get comfortable a couple of times, and both times he got hit with the right hand. Exactly, yeah. So the like, it's worth thinking about what led up to that knockdown in the second round. It's Bisping, Bisping started to feel it. He started to sit down on his shots. He started to let them go with a little more force. Like he was really, he was really turning his weight into his shots in a way that he hadn't up until that point. And then he got clocked. Mm-hmm. And so after that, in the third, fourth, and fifth round, he kind of went back to light punching in and out Bisping. And that's why the fight looked closer, I think, than it actually was mm-hmm. in terms of the in terms of landed volume, because Bisping didn't have those big definitive moments that he had in his prior fights where he really got his confidence up. He never got his confidence up to that extent in this fight. Yeah, absolutely. I, I thought Bisping's game plan was smart. I thought it may actually have been more effective if he had base if he had ignored all thought of hurting Dan Henderson and really just picked him apart. Um, but I don't think that's something that Michael Bisman can easily do. And in fact, I think that's probably why this is such a tough matchup for him, why Dan Henderson is such a tough matchup, because Michael Bisping has the skills to be a, an outfighter, to be a boxer, but I think he's a boxer puncher at heart. I think ever since the very beginning of his career, he has enjoyed going after people and knocking people out. And that sounds kind of silly to the generation that grew up with Michael Bisping being the, you know, the quote unquote pillow fisted fighter, but the beginning stages of his UFC career was all first round knockouts. Um, And then lately we've seen him learning to sit down better and he, the knockouts have returned despite the increase in quality of competition. He has always been a guy who enjoys pursuing that knockout. And I think that it's just a dangerous thing against Dan Henderson. When that first knockdown happened, Bisping survived the round, but I think I tweeted something like uh, you just can't ever afford to get bold against Dan Henderson. You know, like he is not a fighter that you can decide to let your guard down against uh, because of the amount of of experience he has. And, you know, I thought the tactics Bisping was using early on in the fight, basically living off of the left side of his body, using his jab, longest, safest strike. Um, I thought the left kick was a really nice touch. It seemed to me that he was using it both to damage Dan Henderson's right arm um catch him in the head of course if he could but damage his right arm so that the power would come out of it a little bit and i think to keep that right arm at home so that even if henderson was blocking it he wasn't countering with his right hand and he was maybe nervous about the kick to the degree that the right hand would stay you know in a defensive position those things i think won bisping the rounds that he won they won bisping the larger portions of the first two rounds despite the two knockdowns uh but dan henderson to me had the perfect game plan as well. Um, Not that it was a game plan that was always going to result in a win, not that it was a foolproof game plan, but Dan Henderson's game plan was a brilliant gamble for a fighter in his position. Because, I mean, frankly, we all know, Dan Henderson cannot match Michael Bisping's work rate. Dan Henderson cannot even take as much damage as he used to. He can't cover the distance as quickly as he used to, and he can't get takedowns as effectively as he used to, which basically reduces him to a cannon of a right hand. And so what do you do when you have like 19 years of experience and a super heavy right hand and you have learned the hard lesson in your last six fights or so that you are no longer able to chase down opponents the way you might have done the way you did to Michael Bisping the first time? Well, you hang back and you wait for the guy to screw up and you take advantage of the fact that you know what an opening looks like and that you still have some good hand speed. And so Dan Henderson hung back and he let Michael Bisping screw up and he clocked him and it almost won the fight. It very nearly won him the fight. Had he done it in another round, those two judges who gave him the first two rounds may have given him the fight as a whole. 
And also, it allowed him to survive to the fifth round. As you said, Pat, he came out looking extremely fresh in the fifth round, far fresher than anyone expected because he wasn't chasing Bisping. He wasn't opening himself up to punishment. He just held things back and looked for the big openings for the big shot. It made sense. Yeah. It was a remarkably efficient performance from him. And this, is this I think, like Dan Henderson has always thrown these hard, hard, hard low kicks. Like yeah. they, they look awkward, but they're they're quite powerful and quite forceful. Yeah. And he does a pretty good job of setting them up, all things considered. Um, this fight, I think the, the flip side to, or the other side of, of him um, being able to scare Bisping off sitting down his punches was he wore Bisping down in ways that mm-hmm. I don't think Bisping is used to being worn down. Um, like he landed a shitload of low kicks over the course of the fight. I think he landed, uh, I think he landed like 35 or 40 low kicks. Fight like metric about... says he landed, uh, 35% of 100 and oh, sorry. 35% of 81 strikes to the legs. So I'll figure that out while you keep talking. Yeah. Go, uh, open up the tab below that and it'll tell you exactly how many strikes landed to what location. Which tab is that? Um, <laughs> okay. You, you don't, go don't, on. Don't I'll figure it out. <laughs> he landed, but he landed somewhere. He landed somewhere around uh, around 30, 30 or thirty five low kicks over the course of the fight. Like I don't think Bisping is used to getting hit that much to his legs and body. Um, he and I think it, and I think it warmed twenty eight and a half kicks. Okay, so that's a so that's a lot of that's a lot of damage to take from a guy who kicks hard like Dan Henderson does. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that part of the reason that Bisping was couldn't really sit down was because he was afraid of planting and getting low kicked the way that sure. uh, and so um when when henderson went on the attack i don't think it was a coincidence that he was finishing his shots with his combinations with low kicks yeah uh, and this was how henderson stayed relatively effective into the in, into the last two rounds like much more effective than you would have expected in the past is because though he did slow bisping slowed too and this was something that we talked about um, before the Anderson Silva and before the Luke Rockwell fights with Bisping, you and I both noticed when he fought Talos Lites last summer, uh, he slowed down a bit in the later rounds. Like mm-hmm. his famous, it, Bisping's famous cardio may be diminishing just a bit as time goes on. Yeah. Like if you really work him over, if you really force him to work, he may not be the same kind of fifth round fighter that we would expect him to be at this point at 37 years old now. Yeah, which which is understandable. I mean, but but that's I think what that's to me what made this fight so fascinating. We have two aging fighters who are both trying to contend with their advanced age in uh, different ways. And I like I was I was really blown away. It, It sounds really reductive just saying like Dan Henderson's strategy was to wait to land the right hand. But I think Dan Henderson had to had to battle some instincts to do that. And I think Michael Bisping largely failed to battle his instincts. And that's why this fight was tough for him. Um, Had Dan Henderson tried to do what he did to Michael Bisping the first time, I think he would have uh, been very likely been knocked out early into the fight. But because he was so patient and he, he gambled using his considerable, considerable experience and craft. Um, he was able to look almost as effective as he was the first time around. And I, I yeah, I, th- I was pretty blown away by that. I did not expect Dan Henderson to come in and fight smart. And he fought smart. You know, he fought smart the only way that you can. He, he strikes me as like a, like a Sam Langford type fighter. Sam Langford, you know, blinding in one eye, 32. Two years old at a time when, you know, somebody who was a small heavyweight who fought the kind of schedule you fought in those days typically couldn't make it past his late 20s. And he's losing like 14 of 17 fights to Harry Wills, but he still manages to knock Harry Wills out in two of those fights. And that's Stan Henderson at this point is all you have left is your craft, uh, your experience and your power. And so you go into a fight and you're like, I'm, I'm not going to make it easy for this guy. And in the meantime, I'm always going to be looking for that opening. And with that experience, you're going to be more capable of finding that opening, identifying it when it does appear than pretty much anybody else, you know? So Dan Henderson for the win. Yeah. I, I, I was, I was happy with it. And, and to me, this is like, I think you can draw Dan Henderson's career into four distinct styles that are very, very distinct from each other with obviously some blurring lines, but there are, there are fights that really look like each of those styles. And like initial Dan Henderson is maybe typified by the Carlos Newton fight. We have a smothering kind of grinder. And then 
the second stage of Dan Henderson, which is when Dan became a little more comfortable and realized he could hit hard. Maybe that's uh, typified by, I don't know, the... I would say the Vanderlei fight, the, the, the second Vanderlei fight. Sure, and maybe started to come around around the time of the Henzo Gracie fight, his first knockout, and lasted for a long time until the Vanderlei Silva rematch when he knocked him out. And then he tried to do that kind of stuff to Rampage and Anderson Silva. It didn't work. And so then by the time of the Michael Bisping fight, the new style came around. Henderson was a better striker, more of a pressure fighter, using a more intelligent array of setups and forcing his opponent to react. And then the speed started to go and the durability went with it uh, around the time of like the Musasi fights, the Belfort, the two, last two Belfort fights and everything. And so finally, Dan Henderson becomes this really patient, fragile, but dangerous counterpuncher. And he was, I think, at a certain point, no matter how you adapt to your body's changing uh, composition, you're not going to be able to counteract all of the effects of age. And that's quite clearly true with Dan Henderson. But the fact that he found a style that worked after all the time, I think is a testament to his intelligence as a fighter, a guy who has often kind of seemed like a brute in his fighting style. I, I don't, don't think you can undersell the fact that he, there was always purpose to what Dan, Dan Henderson did in the ring or the cage. So it was a pleasure to see him turn on, uh, turn in one last really impressive performance. Um, when we come back from this break, Pat, I think we're going to kind of run through the rest of what stood out to us from UFC 204. Um, getting the last squeeze out of this uh, current uh, glut of UFC cards. And then we're going to have some thematic episodes because we're going to have to in the coming weeks to uh, get off of that UFC schedule. But there were actually a lot of really good fights on this card. Um, I was not sold on the notion that it was a shitty card from the get-go, and I was really pleased to see that it, it really delivered in some exciting action. So when we come back, we're going to talk about some other guys who have gone through some stages in their careers, guys like Gegard Mousasi and Vitor Belfort, guys like Jimmy Manoa, um, and potentially guys like Mirsad Bektic, Yuri Alcantara, and there might even be more. So uh, the rest of UFC 204 evolutions of fighters after this hey everybody thanks for listening to this week's heavy hands if you like what you hear please consider pledging to support the podcast on patreon patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding you sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like and in return you get rewards ranging from a mention on the heavy hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show we have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. And we are back, and let's talk about uh, some more middleweights. Pat, you know that's my jam. So how about Gegard Mousasi and Vitor Belfort, with the theme being career stages? What can you Ooh. say about the stage at which these two men find themselves currently? Ooh. Uh, I thought that this was the best version of Mousasi that we've ever seen. Like, It's really easy at this stage in his career to write Belfort off as kind of a paper tiger, uh, now that he's post TRT, he's 39 years old. He's been fighting as a pro for literally 20 years. It's really easy to look at him and say, to look at him and say, well, he's not the fighter he was, or he's not, or he's not great without TRT. Well, Belfort is still one of the best pure athletes in that division, even at 39 years old. He's still unbelievably fast. He hits unbelievably hard, and you can't walk forward and take him lightly. You know, you yeah. can't just you can't just go out there and think, well, he's not the guy he, he used to he be. He looked it in this matchup, too. He looked dangerous and very fast. Yeah, I mean, and he managed to land some good shots. And a, a less durable fighter than Gegard Mousasi might have found himself in trouble eating a couple of the shots that he ate. Even though Belfort only landed, I think, eight strikes the entire fight, any one of those shots could have finished a guy. Mm -hmm. Like, they were all brutal, brutal shots. So, um, point being... You can't like take anything away from Musasi for the for for beating like a faded Vitor Belfort because I don't think he is faded. Um, Musasi just took him apart, absolutely dismantled him. Had exactly the right game plan, knew exactly what he was doing from the opening bell. Like he did not have any of that sometimes listless Gegard Musasi to him where like he's just going to go out there and he's going to kind of do his thing like he was tight he was focused from the very beginning he knew exactly what he wanted to do so the way that he used his jab and inside low kick to take away the outside angle that Belfort so dearly wanted like he managed to he managed to limit 
Belfort's opportunities to to proactively throw the left hand mm -hmm. uh, and turned Belfort, who already may have been leaning in that direction to conserve energy, into a pure counter puncher instead of somebody who could still occasionally get off first. Um, and and if you're Gegard Musasi and you've got Belfort backed up to the fence, even though he's fast, even though he's dangerous, you're much more comfortable with Belfort as a counter puncher than you are with a guy who can who can time his left hand um, coming forward. You know, sure, yeah. Like that's a like that is a much more rational way to deal with that problem. So he took away the outside angle from Belfort um, and then forced Belfort back into his right hand. But it was clear like he did a very good job of sweeping him in the direction that he wanted him to go, uh, which is uh, an, an essential thing. If you want to be an aggressive fighter, you have to be able to move your opponent at will. And he did that all fight. Just just swept Belfort from one side back to the other using his strikes and his footwork. Yeah. It was real it was a crisp performance. Yeah, absolutely. I it's interesting you say um I want to go back to something you said before. You, you mentioned that Vitor isn't really a faded fighter and it's weird to hear you say that cuz I think I might kind of agree. Um it doesn't seem to me that athletically Vitor Belfort has really lost a lot of what made him the phenom way back when. I think he's still very fast. I think he's still obviously very powerful. Um, now he's got a lot more experience to go on. Um, the weird thing with Vitor Belfort, if we look at him in, in a, through the lens of career phases, is that he has gone basically from A to B to A. I think he is much more now the original Vitor Belfort than he was uh, when he kind of fluked his way to the top of the division with the, all of the TRT, which which it, it's seeming more and more now did have a massive impact on the way he performed, how long he was able to fight at his chosen pace, and certainly how confident he felt in his power. Um, and now it seems a little more like the classic Vitor Belfort where, you know, he's he's out wrestleable. He kind of loses his edge when the other guy doesn't go away quickly. Um, and, you know, he's still... But but physically, I think he's just as dangerous. And mentally, at worst, I think he's the same as he was way back in 1997. Yeah, I mean, I think that what we're seeing now is basically like the 2009, 2010, 2011 version of Vitor Belfort. More like, of a counterpuncher, but like not this terrifying physical force. Yeah, so I would – so there – I think – we got to let's let's take a step back here because I don't really agree with your with with your description of Belfort's career arc. So I think that there was the original Vitor who was just an athletic freak and wanted to come after guys, not necessarily with a lot of crap, but just overwhelming speed and power. Blitz then, Vitor. Yeah, the Blitz Vitor. Then there was Russell Vitor who would just out wrestle dudes <laughs> okay. and he did that yeah. and he did that in pride. Then there was Return to the UFC Vitor who was a little craftier and a little more diverse than he had been early in his career. Didn't really want to wrestle anymore. Was kind of through with that, but still had the same kind of mental issues. Then he was kind of back to wrestling a little bit and kind of lost his kind of lost his mojo uh, for a few years. And then when he returned to the UFC in in 2009 or so, when he when he knocked out Rich Franklin, he was basically the same dude up until the TRT up until TRT tour. I so, think TRT Tour was just that Vitor Belfort, but like <laughs> without the confidence issues and obviously much with better. It stamina. was literally Vitor on steroids. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it was... we use that we use that phrase, but that's exactly what it was. And so yeah. And so now I think he's still more or less that same dude, though he's he's crafty. He's very, very crafty. He's yeah. better. He has been better in recent years. I would say since 2009 or so, 2010. I agree, yeah. Of finding I, ways to land his left hand. Yeah, and the kicking game that came out of that phase as well. I, I, I forgot about Wrestle Vitor. I went right from Blitz Vitor to Modern Vitor. So there's Blitz Vitor, there's Wrestle Vitor, and then the one in 2009 we'll call that Karate Vitor. Because that was when Vitor started yeah. training with the... He started doing some Shotokan Karate and realized that he had legs as well as hands that he could throw at his opponent. <laughs> And yeah, because when... before that, he would throw some knees occasionally, but he was never yeah. much of a kicker. No, he became more focused on counters, um, and he became more of a kicker. And that was basically the Vitor that carried through until the Chris Weidman fight, which is post-TRT ban, in which I think he retained that skill set, but reverted to the mentality of Blitz Vitor. He kind of lost his mental edge, it seemed. Um, and probably yeah. some of the physical ability that allowed him to go... Um, you know, I think maybe he felt himself waning more mm -hmm. strongly, but also he did wane more strongly in each fight. Yeah, this is true. I mean, so I don't mean to say that he isn't really faded because he is faded, but 
he's still really, really, really dangerous. Like, yeah. he, I don't think that Vitor has fallen off a cliff the way that a lot of fighters do at the end of their careers. No, it's just that he fought Chris Weidman and Jacare Souza, who both beat him the same way. Gegard Mousasi is, you know, he, he beat him really impressively. And, and other performances are like, I mean, he gets to walk over Dan Henderson and everything, but, like, I think if you gave Vitor Belfort, if he... Uh, he says he's retired now, which, you know, he's earned it and so on and so forth. But if he were to go on there and fight, I don't know, somebody like, I don't know, who, who the hell is like mid-tier middleweight or like like lower top 10, I'd say Vitor Belfort would have a good chance of beating a lot of those guys. I'm going to look at some. Hey, would you, would you pick him over Uriah Hall right now? Because um, I, I think I, I probably would. Yeah, I think I probably would. You know, like it would be it's an interesting fight, but not not for any reasons that many of Vitor's fights have been, you know, like cl- hard ones to call. It's it's just kind of like he's still Vitor. So I, I think the win was really impressive. And for Musasi's part, I think this marks a sort of a career evolution for him as well, because I think um, for a long time. Uh, this is something that I have mentioned a lot lately, ever since I think you and I and probably Zane Simon uh, all started to kind of come up with this notion that there are fighters who start young and they fight everywhere and anywhere and everyone and anybody. Um, and they kind of turn into these perfect journeymen where they are perfectly designed to not lose anywhere in the world against anybody. Um, almost irrespective of weight class or level of competition, they're going to be hard to outclass. Um, and these are guys like Gegard Mousasi, like uh, Jorge Masvidal, like Sean Strickland, who hasn't quite reached his full maturation yet, uh, like Rory McDonald. These are guys who all started really, really young, uh, fighting fighters much more experienced and older than from a very early stage. And so a lot of these guys have had issues with taking over a fight. You know, a lot of them have had like their McDonald Ellenberger or their Masvidal Larkin or whatever, where they go into a fight and they're clearly competitive with the, whoever they're fighting. Um, but they also clearly have difficulty pulling the trigger and doing something to take over the fight, to prove that they are a class above. And I think Gegard Mousasi was one of these fighters. He started really young. He has an insane amount of experience for his age. And for a long time, he was this guy who you knew how good he was, but anytime he stepped up in competition, he just couldn't make it happen because the other guy was more focused and more determined to win, whereas Mousasi was more reactive and more determined to not get destroyed. And I think the last two fights are the first time we've really seen Gegard Mousasi consistently look like he wants to beat his opponent. And not just beat him, but beat the shit out of him. We have finally seen Gegard Mousasi go from patient journeyman to mean contender. And I think that's a brilliant evolution. And I think now is probably the time more than ever where Mousasi may actually be able to make a run at uh, the middleweight title. Yeah, I think that there there has always kind of been something standing in the way of of Musasi getting to that point, um, because when he has been felt comfortable letting his hands go, he will he will get after you mm-hmm. like in the past. Like we saw that uh, you saw his uh, kickboxing fight with Kyotaro, right? Yeah. And yeah. So in that fight, he really got after Kyotaro. Yeah. Like really got after like him, insane, really pressured insanely. him. Hard. He went after him Aaron Pryor style from the opening bell. Yeah, and so I think that when he feels free to do that, like Musasi will do it, and he'll do it hardcore. But he's, but I think that there's always kind of been something standing in the way of that. Whether it's been he's not really feeling into it, and he doesn't prepare very hard. Like he's owned up to that in the past. He's just like, yeah, no, I didn't train very hard for this fight. Um, so I think whether it's that and feeling like, well, I've got to manage my energy because I'm not in fantastic shape, or I didn't do the wrestling training that I needed to do to be able to stuff takedowns if he comes after me. Like there has always been something stopping Musasi from, from fully embracing that. And now I think he's clearly working harder than he ever has. He's in better shape than he's ever Mm -hmm. been in. Um, he seems to be taking his career more seriously than he has in the past. Um, now I think that this is this is the new normal from Musasi, and if this is the new normal from Musasi, he's a top he's a top five middleweight easy, and he yeah. can, and if things break right, like with the right matchups, I could see him I, I could see him getting to uh, getting to a title fight like this version of Musasi. I could see beating uh, I could see him beating Romero. I could see him f- uh, winning a rubber match with Jacare if he fights like this, especially if Jacare has fallen off a and, bit, and especially if he doesn't have the small cage like he did last time. 
yeah, that was definitely a factor in that fight. Mm-hmm. It was really hard for him to get to open space. Yeah. Um, I could see him beating. I think he could, you know, like being out wrestled and everything, but going down the going down the stretch, like I think he has a shot against all the top four. He definitely has a shot against Michael Bisping. I think I might oh, pick I, Musasi in that fight. I think I would. There's no question in my mind that <laughs> yeah, I would pick Musasi yeah. in that fight. I think he would take this swing apart. <laughs> yeah, it's you know if you look through Musasi's career, like really all of the performances where he's blown somebody out of the water have been against people that yeah you kind of expect it to happen. He has never destroyed somebody that you wouldn't expect him to destroy. And in fact, if it's a fight where you don't ex- where you you don't expect him to destroy the guy, but he might beat him, he often loses that fight. Um, because I think he only ha- feels comfortable pressuring someone typically when they give him the opportunity to pref- pre- to pressure. And this is the first time I think that Musasi has taken that 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 permission from his opponent um, in, in in over the course of a long and storied career. And you know, to his credit, the thing that always made Musasi so special was his unbelievable poise under pressure that he has always been impossible to shake. Like, the the deadpan facade is not a facade. I think that is Musasi. You know, I saw, saw somebody said somebody said watching uh, the Embedded series last week, they said, um, Dan Henderson embarrasses his daughter at school, uh, seems, like a, seems like a dad. Uh, Michael Bisping does the same thing with his kids, you know, like jokes around with his kids. Gigger Musasi lives by the gym. <laughs> <laughs> and like <laughs> just the image of those guys being real people and joking around and then Musasi puts on flip flops and walks to the gym, which is basically next door. Like that's a guy guard Musasi. He's very difficult mm-hmm. to shake. But having the ability to turn that poise into uh to, to hone that into this dangerous offensive fighter is something entirely different. Yeah, I mean it's I'm always wary when we have when we talk about fighters like this, when we talk about mindset, because I think it's really easy to to fall into cliches when we do that. Sure. And I think one of the things I like about our show is that we don't fall into cliches very often, I don't think. But with Musasi, it's kind of hard to avoid cliches um, in the sense that, like, no, he really is taking his career more seriously now. He really is working harder than he was. He really is going out there thinking, oh, I need to not just like scrape out a decision against this guy. I need to beat the crap out of him because my time is limited. I've been doing this forever. We might as well actually try and make something of this, Mm -hmm. you know, like that. This is where Musasi is. This is where Musasi is as a fighter and it's where he is in his career right now. And I think like it, like it's hard to, it's hard to take that seriously when you say it all the time. So I think take us seriously when we say that this really is what's going on. I don't don't think we often go out there and say, Oh, he's, He's back this time, this time back with a vengeance. He's, we, he's oh, taking... we don't say that, but these are common MMA cliches. Yeah, yeah. But Gagar Musasi has often looked serious. I think this may be the first time that he really has been. Um, let's go on then to light heavyweights. The uh, We're basically going in reverse order here down the uh, UFC 204 card. Jimmy Manoa finally impressed. He got the opportunity to go in there against a credible opponent and actually put on a good performance, something he may have been able to do against John Blakovich if he hadn't had his knee destroyed, something he certainly could have done had he beaten Anthony Johnson or Alexander Gustafson, but both of those guys kind of destroyed him with ease. And that's kind of been the story of Jimmy Manuel's career, is being um, an insanely physically gifted fighter who has a natural knack for things like distance and timing with his strikes, but for whom depth of skill maybe hasn't always been there and who isn't necessarily the most durable fighter in the world either. And so Manoa has basically been in this position where, since coming to the UFC, he's in this crazily shallow division. He marks himself out as obviously physically superior to the guys who aren't in the top 10, but then he he ends up proving that he doesn't belong in the top 5. And this is the first time that he fought somebody of that level and really looked impressive against them. I, I was very, very... Uh, impressed by his performance against OSP here. Yeah, it's really interesting to me looking at Jimmy Manoa and Mike Perry side by side. And that might sound like a strange combination. Um, Mike Perry knocked out Danny Roberts in very impressive fashion on the on the prelims. Perry has now knocked out both of his uh, UFC opponents. And leaving aside the fact that he seems to be kind of a garbage person, um, he's like a very talented 
a very naturally talented guy. And I think that this is a type that you see in MMA. People who don't necessarily have a prior background in combat sports. Manawa didn't at all. Manawa started training in MMA because he was a power lifter and he tore his pec while while benching 405. Like, <laughs> that's the kind of athletic specimen that, that Jimmy Manawa is. Uh, and Mike Perry, like... Mike Perry left jail and went to a UFC gym to train. Like, but he's and it, he's that's that literally happened. He literally went straight from jail to the UFC. And then gym. recently, he got a tattoo saying "Platinum" on his face. So, <laughs> but, I have no response to that. Yeah, that, I just want to give an impression. He now has a tattoo saying "Platinum." I think under his right eye, uh, kind of around his right, kind of around his uh, right eye socket. Somewhere, yeah, it's, around uh, I'd say it curves around, curvilinear. <laughs> uh, so, okay. But that word is not suitable being, for a description like, of Mike Perry's tattoos. Jesus fucking Christ, man. <laughs> uh, okay, so Mike Perry. Mike Perry and, and Jimmy Manuel. I put them side by side because they're both specimens. They're both super fast, super athletic, super strong. And they both seem to have kind of a natural knack. Like... Perry has only been fighting as a professional for two years. Mm -hmm. um, Manawa had only been fighting as a pro for, I think, three, three and a half years when he signed with the UFC. But but clearly they got it. Like there was something that clicked about this to them. Like there are things that both guys did when they were starting in terms of shot selection, in terms of distance management, in terms of knowing when and uh, in timing, knowing when and how to pull the trigger uh, that made them look much more advanced than they actually were at that point. And I think that we saw some of the limitations of that when Manawa was thrown in there because light heavyweight is such a, is such a shallow division mm -hmm. with really, really, really good fighters. We saw that he really didn't have that much depth of skill to him because when you start training at 28 or whatever, which Manawa did, and you don't have a prior background in combat sports, you just can't have learned that much, no matter what a natural you are. Same deal with Perry, like Perry. And we saw this when, uh, when Danny Roberts was like on his bike and sticking and moving with Perry, like Perry didn't really know how to pressure that effectively. Mm -mm. Like there are clearly, there clearly wasn't that much depth of skill. Like, it was, I'm natural... going to stand in front of you and hit you when you try to hit me. Yeah. And like, and he, there, he has, he's picked up enough tricks to be really effective doing that mm -hmm. in combination with his natural skill. But I think that Manawa is where we might see a fighter like Perry end up in a few years, because this to me was the first time that we saw Manawa really show off depth of skill in terms of, sh in terms of, um, multiple responses to different problems with which Ovent St. Pru presented him, um, multiple responses, multiple kinds of shots, different, varied timing, varied setups, like knew exactly what he wanted to do in terms of a game plan and went out there and, and pulled it off. Like, I thought that this was the most complete performance of Manoa's career. And so to bring this back to Perry, like, I think Perry is going to struggle. Like, I think it's a real possibility that we're going to see Perry lose two fights that we don't think he's going to lose in a row. And then he'll be kind of written off and then he'll be like, oh, no, but he's really raw. And he'll come back kind of in, in, mm -hmm. in more impressive fashion. Like, yeah, because I think a lot of people wrote Manawa off, too. Sure. Yeah. And, and I coming into this fight, really predicting it, I think I, I said I think I gave the impression in my, my preview, like this is a fight that Manu could win on skill, but he hasn't proven that he can hang with somebody who has that kind of intangible ability, intangible ability that OSP um, has proven he has. And it was I think it's it's the difference between being a fighter who looks good on the heavy bag and a fighter who looks good against a an elite competitive opponent. The early guys that Jimmy Mann were fighting were essentially heavy bags. He got to throw his combinations. He got to show how good his form was. He got to show how powerful he was. But this is the first time that we've seen him against someone who was an elite fighter in this division where Manawa, as you said, showed that he could change rhythm that he could measure his distance, that he could uh, move around his opponent, that he wasn't just basically nailing you with his left hand and his left shin on different targets. Which, again, there's something to be said for the fact that Manuel had a knack for knowing how setups worked. He knew he could hit you to the body and bring your head down. But it was basically just, I'm going to hit you really hard with everything, and when I see you reacting to full power strike A, I'm going to follow up with full power strike B. And when it was somebody who who wasn't just waiting on him to cause those setups, that's when he struggled. And this is the first time, you know, he had somebody who wasn't just waiting on him, somebody who was in there with a focused game plan of their own um, that they were able to stick to, and he took him apart. So very impressive. Mike Perry, um, the saga of Mike Perry. You know Mike, you know Mike Perry has a podcast? He's a competitor now, Pat. He, uh, he recently published the first episode of The Platinum Podcast, a show dedicated, devoted to all things Platinum Mike Perry. I mean, 
<laughs> he, a, we should. Well, have... I, I love the fact that the friend friend of the show uh, le- at leg kick TKO on Twitter sure um, has has referred to him as Florida MMA man. Just uh, sure, he, yeah. he is he is Florida man, but the MMA twist on that he is exactly what you would expect. So I don't know. I mean, I respect Mike Perry's hustle and his dedication to, sure. to getting out there and like. There is a lot to find admirable about Mike Perry's discipline and dedication he, and, and the he fact has, that he's as good as he is after training such a short period of time. But my God, man. He has made God. himself known, too. Like, I think people know who Mike Perry is in the way they don't with most new fighters. So props to him for that. Um, and I think you're right. He will probably end up in the position that Jimmy Manoa is in now in a couple of years if he hasn't killed in a meth lab explosion before then. Because Florida. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> because Florida, Pat. Because or or like running a speedboat into a <laughs> in, into a submerged reef, like that's the other <laughs> valid possibility here. Is just Mike Perry spends some of his platinum on uh, on a cigarette boat and uh, and runs into a runs into a boy, like that's a lot of possibilities, a lot of possibilities oh. here. But oh a lot God. of respect for Mike Perry's kind of kind of craft and and what have you. Not less for less for blackface, less oh. for the blackface. If it is blackface, I don't even know what the hell Mike Perry's about, man. Who knows? He's inscrutable. He's not. He's not inscrutable. He's very scrutable. The problem is you don't like what you scrute. No. <laughs> his motivations are inscrutable. It's like, what are you thinking, Mike Perry? What are you trying nothing. to say? Nothing. He's not thinking anything. Yeah. That's exactly the. That's exactly Fully it. Automatic. Like, this is the problem with trying to with going out of your way to try and interpret the behavior of somebody like that is like you assume that there's an underlying thing because when you do things there's an under there's an underlying reasoning there. Like not everybody works like that. Yeah. Mike Mike Perry is the darkness that comes before. He is uh, his his actions are unknown even to himself. Um all right. So let's uh, let, let's go ahead and make that our wrap up point. Do you have any other fighters from this card that you really want to talk about or maybe we should spread them over to the next segment before we do Aaron Pryor. So Yeah, Yuri Alcantara. Yeah, and uh, and Mirsad Bektic too. And of course Mirsad Bektic. Okay, one more break. We'll be back to talk about those guys and then Aaron the Hawk Pryor. Financial support is fantastic, but there are other even easier ways to support heavy hands. Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are. But no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. And you can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve. So thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. And we have returned. Let's go ahead and talk about Mirsad Bektic first. Fans of this show know that we are fans of Mirsad Bektic. Both of us were a little worried about what he would look like coming back. I was um, consoling myself with the knowledge that basically he tore his ACL. He was approved for training and successfully made it through the first camp after his recovery. So that, that gave me hope to think that his recovery went well. Um, I saw nothing in this performance, Pat to think that uh, Mirsad Bektic isn't back, um, at least for the most part. In fact, it didn't look as hard for him as we kind of thought it would. Well, so I think this is the thing about Mirsad Bektic is that everything happens on like fast forward, right? So I said before the fight that I, I would not be surprised if he got tagged a little bit early and he had to, as he was kind of shaking off some ring rust, that happened in one exchange. <laughs> it, it took, took like one 20 exchange. seconds and then it ended that phase. Yeah, which is like, and, and I guess that's what we should expect from Mirsad Bektic. Like, oh, no, you spend 17 months on the shelf dealing with a major knee injury, and it takes you one exchange to get back into to get back into your <laughs> Literally ring. that one like, shot shattered and shook off all the ring rust. The one yeah, shot he that, ate. That's all it took um, because he won the second exchange. Yeah. He absolutely blasted Doan with a, with a right hand in the second exchange, and that which allowed him to get in on his takedown. Like, that was so... I think that says a lot about Bektic. Um, I would not be surprised if he got back in there real quick. I wish he had done a better job of, uh, of of calling somebody out. I would like to see him fight somebody like Anthony Pettis. I think that that would be the right kind of fight to make for him. Yeah. Um, but I doubt the UFC will. I doubt the UFC will make it. Who do you no. think they have him fight next, Connor? I don't know. I think Anthony Pettis is a great shout. If not that, somebody maybe like Dennis Bermudez. Um, two little muscle balls that get to go at each other. Um, yeah, 
I like Anthony Pettis though. That's actually the name I had in mind myself. I think that's a really good fight. That like that's an opportunity for Bektic to go in there against somebody who still has a bankable name in what is a very winnable matchup for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or it, like I think I assume Frankie Edgar will beat Jeremy Stevens, but uh, I would say, but like I would say, even the Stevens Edgar winner would not be would not be out of the question for him. But I think that they're going to bring him along a little more slowly. I think likely it may be someone like Darren Elkins, it may be someone like uh, Charles Oliveira, somebody a little lower down the totem pole. Even Hanan Barrow, I think, wouldn't be uh, wouldn't I be out of the question. Not. I'm on the Hanan Barrow train now. I want to see him do well. Although it's not an unwinnable fight for him, it's not. No, huh? No, but uh, like that, that takedown. Bektich would have to win that on the feet. Yeah, I that think. that takedown defense changes everything, actually. So. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he looked good, man. It wasn't even. I I would I would I would dare to say that he looked a lot better in his comeback fight than Khabib Nurmagomedov did in his. Um, I don't think he had any kind of trouble there. And the other guy we wanted to talk about, Pat, was uh, Yuri Alcantara. Kind of a career capping performance for him, granted against uh, Brad Pickett, who is really at the end of his road um, and has seemed to be headed that way for a long time. But still, Alcantara fought a pretty perfect fight against him and made it look spectacular to boot. Yeah, that was fantastic. This is the performance that we've been waiting for from Yuri Alcantara for a long time, where he kind of put everything together into a coherent whole. Like he's been training at Jackson Wink for his last couple of fights. And I think it was pretty clear that he came into this fight with both a plan and, uh, and, uh, um, like he came out hot. Like in the past, he's had real problems like throwing actual volume. Like he's been one of those kind of guys who's generally happy to let the fight flow where it may. Mm-hmm. But this time he came out there looking to control what happened, looking to control the distance, control the angles, uh, control the pace. Like he wanted to work fast, he wanted to work at long range, and then when Pickett uh, when when Pickett got inside, that's when he threw that gorgeous spinning elbow. And the finishing sequence was one of the sweetest things I've ever seen. From the moment the spinning elbow landed to the moment that Pickett tapped was just absolutely yeah. sublime. It was like a religious experience. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't reactive from Alcantara the entire fight. He 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 was very proactive. He he wasn't trying to figure Pickett out. He knew exactly what would work against Pickett, or he at least knew what he was going to attempt. Uh, to make work and then yeah the finishing sequence spinning elbow to punch combination uh, transition off of the defensive takedown attempt to a submission attempt to another submission attempt to another submission attempt Alcantara from the elbow through the 45 second or so sequence that led to the the final the eventual end of the fight was always one step ahead of Brad Pickett it was really really impressive um, yeah, it was just it was just fantastic work. I mean, like, yeah. it, like it's weird to be a 36 year old bantamweight, like finally hitting your stride, yeah. at, like after 12 years as a pro. But like, I think that's kind of where we are with Alcantara. Like, his talent has never been in doubt. He's a stupid good athlete. He is a, he's got great killer instinct in every phase of the fight. He's not even a bad wrestler, um, though that has been his it, that has been a problem for him a little bit in the past. Like, he's just like but he's never put everything together this time he put absolutely everything together yeah and i thought he looked okay in the jimmy rivera fight too he got two flash knockdowns on rivera um and he wasn't easily out wrestled which is kind of what i think a lot of people expected rivera to do to him i think it's not that alcantara has ever lacked a certain area of skill i think it's that he's lacked focus that he has lacked uh like the ability to game plan for an opponent the ability to Uh, really hone in on one set of skills or one type of attack that is working for him. And so that's why Alcantara has this reputation as a guy who can't wrestle because it's not because he can't stop a takedown or because he can't scramble, but because more often than not when he's been taken down in the past, he has opted to stay on his back and, and start fighting like a grappler. He has allowed his opponent to dictate where the fight takes place and at what pace. And he hasn't done that for his last two fights, and it didn't work out against Jimmy Rivera. Uh, but he sure didn't, his, didn't get mollywopped by Rivera the way the other two guys, the other three guys Rivera's fought in the UFC have. And he absolutely destroyed Brad Pickett. And really, I think any other result would have been kind of disappointing for where Alcantara is in his career right now compared to Pickett. It's a kind of fight where you thought, yeah, he maybe won't destroy him because Pickett's tough. But the fact that he did just run roughshod over Pickett is the the best possible result, you know, for obvious reasons. Um as a wrap-up, Pat, let's talk a little bit about Aaron Pryor. 
uh, Aaron Pryor, like I said at the top of the show, one of my all-time favorite boxers. Um, I kind of identify as a bit of a pressure fighter myself when I am in training. Um, and so I especially like seeing good pressure fighters, guys like Pryor, like Henry Armstrong, like uh, Chavez, fighters who are not just brutes, but who are intelligent pressure fighters. And there are a few fighters who are both as intelligent and as relentless as Aaron Pryor as a pressure fighter. Um, in his time, he just, uh, like I alluded to earlier in the show, he started at an absolutely blistering pace and very rarely let up. And when he did, he did it really intelligently. And so um, let's talk about your experience with Aaron Pryor. He just passed away on uh, uh, Sunday. Yeah, on Sunday, on the 9th. Um, and again, Cincinnati fighter, you know I got to give love to the the few good fighters that come out of my hometown. And Aaron Pryor was probably the last who really, really uh, proved himself to be a great, great boxer. Wait, wasn't there a more recent uh, fighter uh, that came out know, of Cincinnati? No, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, no, you're not in a certain uh, certain guy, A.B.? A.B. Uh, it's not ringing any bells. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fucking Adrian Broner, man. Um, Certainly okay. not up to the par of guys like Aaron Pryor and Ezard Charles, mm -hmm. or even guys like Tony Tubbs. He doesn't come up to that bar. No, so... Aaron Pryor, man, like like you, I love pressure fighting. I love it as a genre. I love watching it. Um, it's my preferred mode when I can uh, when I when I used to get out there and get after it. Um, I really really like pressure fighting, and very few guys have done it more intelligently than Pryor. Yeah. Uh, I really like the variety of tools that he had for doing it, and I think the great irony to me of his two great fights with Alexis Arguello, Alexis Arguello, who's the mentor to uh, Roman Chocolatito Gonzalez, is that. Uh, R Roman Gonzalez does a lot of things that Aaron Pryor used to do. Yeah, I like, said that actually when I did a piece on 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 Gonzalez, I was like, oh, really? it's 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 kind of, yeah, it's I because it, it seemed poetic. It's kind of like he Alexis Arguello taught him all the things he did well, and then taught him all the things that worked best against him. So mm -hmm. he kind of like turned him into Alexis Arguello doing Aaron Pryor things. Yeah, the my favorite thing that Aaron Pryor did, and I don't th I think this is a super underutilized technique um, for in in all combat sports that, that involves striking, not just in boxing, but also in MMA and kickboxing. Aaron Pryor used to throw a lot of straight lefts with his lead hand, so he's an orthodox fighter, but he would rotate his hips and pull his hips back um, to give his to give not a jab but a straight left. Yeah. He would throw it really, really hard, and he would use the he would use that he would use the way his hips were loaded as a way of covering the distance and stepping forward, and then loading his hips back for the right hand after he landed. So it allowed him to cover distance while packing a lot of force into it. And because he was a guy who jabbed religiously anyway, it was a hard shot to see coming, and guys would really get jolted by it when he threw it. Yeah, uh, it was a it was a really brutal shot the way that he threw it. And it's something that Roman Gonzalez does too. And it's yeah. one of the ways that Gonzalez covers the distance. Yeah. And I think for, for, for a guy who is really, really defined by pressure fighting, like Aaron Pryor, a shot like that makes a lot of sense because one of the difficulties with being a pressure fighter is keeping the pressure on um, the, the benefit of, of, of being the man applying the pressure is that, it gives you time to think. You can kind of just automatically let those punches go and flow um, and think about what you want to do while the other person is constantly reacting to the pressure. They don't have the initiative, so they can't they can't really uh, very easily decide what happens in the fight next, and you can. And uh, so keeping on the pressure is really important. You don't want to give your opponent any opportunities to, to get some breathing room and to take over. And so uh, I think that straight left is a great punch for that because one of the best ways you can keep up pressure is to create the impression that no matter how far away your opponent gets, you're always going to be right on them and hitting them. And it's great to be able to have that punch in addition to a left hook because a left hook is a much shorter punch. Even the longest left hook can't cover as much distance as sort of a, a hard step in or a leaping jab or a left cross can. And so for prior, I think he used it a lot as a follow-up punch to follow opponents with his combinations after they stepped away from the right hand, after they stepped away from the uppercuts and the hooks. And that's really, I guess, his strongest suit and why he was such an impressive opponent for Alexis Arguello, because Arguello was always renowned as a brilliant combination puncher. And I think 
um, Aaron Pryor was maybe the only time in Arguello's entire career that he met his match. Somebody who was a combination puncher as potent, if not more potent than himself, the, with the ability to throw from absolutely any angle, um, whatever the target in front of him required, Aaron Pryor was going to find a way to hit it. Yeah, it was. Ex it's exceptionally impressive, and I just, I like I love it because I love that straight left so much. Like the only one of the other very few guys who throws it is uh, is John Wayne Parr. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I did a seminar with John Wayne Parr, and he he like hammered that punch over and over and over again, precisely for the reason that it allows you to stay after your opponent. Like if you want to be pressuring, it allows you to it allows you to step in with the shot. It allows you to pack some power into it, and it plays off a good jab anyway. But so. Um, I loved watching Aaron Pryor. Uh, I watched like three of his fights last night. Uh, I watched the two fights with Arguello and I watched his fight with uh, the one where he won the title. Who was that? Antonio Cervantes. Yeah. Uh, like that was a, that was another great performance. It's just like there's no way to get away from him. Yeah. No way at all. Yeah. Like and the volume that he worked out was insane. He'd throw 40, 45 punches a minute. Like that's yeah. insane. That is an insane pace to keep. But Connor, one of the things that you've talked about a lot that you really like about Aaron Pryor one of the things you like about him as a pressure fighter is that he could box in between sequences of yeah. pressure. He was a strategic boxer. He would box when it suited him and only when it suited him. And at all other times he was coming forward and firing punches. Yeah. And that's a, like we talked about that, especially in relation to Conor McGregor versus Nate Diaz at mm -hmm. UFC 202, that when McGregor got tired of pressuring, he got tired of coming after Nate Diaz. He was happy to stick and move behind a jab in the middle of the cage. Yeah. The, the difference with Pryor, and I don't know how he managed it. Maybe it was Panama Lewis's special mixed bottle, which is a controversy that will chase Pryor, uh, that will chase Panama Lewis more than Pryor to the end of his days. Some people were lamenting the fact that Panama Lewis, um, maybe some people out there don't know this story, but there was during the Arguello fight, it was like Pryor was slowing down, I think around, around 13 or something like that, and they were giving Pryor water in the corner, and his trainer, or maybe it was his manager, Panama Lewis, said, you know, give me the bottle. No, the one I mixed. Um, and so that's always been very suspicious to people, considering the fact that Pryor then came back and dominated the fight. But I don't know. I, I don't know what you could put in a bottle of water that would make someone immediately come back to life. Like meth or something would maybe have an effect. But really, to me, it, it, I don't worry about it too much with Pryor because, um, A, I think there's plausible deniability. Panama Lewis was been responsible for many scandals throughout his career. I don't say that's necessarily up to Pryor. Rather, Lewis trying to make his fighter win if he did do something. But also, that was just kind of how Pryor fought. Um, the difference between him and a guy like McGregor is that Pryor seemed to have no limit of second, third, fourth wins in his body. That he would box intelligently, he would keep his distance and move and kind of shake his legs and arms out. And that would usually take a round, maybe two, and he'd be back on you just like he was in the first round. I think he never let himself get to the point where he was not in control of how much energy there was in his body. He felt himself slowing down, and that's when he decided to box, and he boxed until he felt good to go again. And he was so incredibly fit that throughout his career, he went through this pattern without fail. He would go in there, he would get a little tired, he would rest up, he would come back and he just did that. So, I, you know, it's not like and, and he was basically dominating the prior fight up to that point anyway. Um, and not the prior fight, the Arguello fight up to that point. Arguello had his moments, but it was really the best performance of Pryor's career and a testament to Arguello's toughness more than his skill that he lasted as long as he did, I think, until the 14th round. So, um, you know, it's Aaron Pryor, man. I, 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 I love watching him work. I, I love seeing a pressure fighter who's really defensively savvy, who basically never, ever lets you miss without immediately countering you, usually with a combination of punches, who knows how to use his jab and is always closing the distance behind it, and who knows how to, how to moderate the kind of pace a pressure fighter needs to be effective. So yeah, those are those are rare tools and rare gifts. And Aaron yeah. Pryor, pretty special fighter. Sad that he fell into so hard into drug abuse in his later career. Yeah, because God knows how good he might have been. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's a it's a common story. But I think he he ended his life fairly happy. I think I think he was a um, a pastor in his last few years here in Cincinnati. Yeah. He was he was drug free for like the last twenty five years of his yeah. life. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a shame that he had to go so soon, but he will be remembered very fondly. And I think he, he ended up his, his life being a pretty positive influence on his community and everything. And uh, so, you know, 
I uh, just wanted to give a chance to remember him. Like I said, one of my favorite fighters. It's really sad for me to uh, to hear that he passed away. And uh, if you do want to go and watch some of his fights to commemorate him, the three that we've discussed are certainly worthwhile. I'd say the the Arguello fight, the Antonio Cervantes fight, and uh, I would say the fight with Miguel Montilla is really good as well. Some of those are ones where uh, Pryor's hectic pace actually got him into trouble in the early going of the fight, and you get to see how fucking tough the guy was, that he could get knocked down in the first round and never even miss a, a stride. That he, he, I mean, when he fought uh, Cervantes, Cervantes dropped him with a right hand, and Pryor was swinging his right arm in a bolo uppercut fashion as he stood up from the punch, like impatiently waiting for the eight count to finish so that he could, he could get back on Cervantes. He's just a really impressive guy and a great example of, you know, one of the most exciting styles of fighting. So I um, hope everything uh, goes well with with his family and everything. And, and it was a pleasure to watch him and to get to talk about him, uh, you know, t- get to talk about him and commemorate his life. Otherwise, I think that's about it for us today. Old fighters, fighters who have passed on, and fighters who are finally coming into their own. It's been a rousing discussion over the course of today's episode. Pat, um, as we head into these weeks of no UFC action, what do you have coming out? Uh, Not a whole lot. I did a uh, duo piece with my colleague Stephen Rondina on where Michael Bisping stacks up in the middleweight division, we think, outside the top five. so uh, that's one thing that we did. Uh, I'm working on a long uh, piece right now on fighter origins. So I'm going through the entire UFC roster and figuring out where fighters are from. And then I'm going to map that out and figure out what are the like the places that produce the most fighters per capita mm-hmm. um, in the UFC. I'm going to narrow it down to like the five uh, to like the uh, the five places, and then I'll go in depth on on why it seems like if those places share anything in common. Um, so like the fightinest places in the world, what are those? Uh, so I'm working on that. I don't know if I'll get that out this week though. Like the, co- just collecting the data takes a tremendous amount of time because there's mm-hmm. like 500 and some odd guys on the roster and figuring out like where they all grew up is, uh, it takes some, it takes some time. It takes some effort. Yeah. Um, then I'll have uh, a new episode of the fall of Rome podcast up this Friday, uh, looking at, uh, the three distinct paths that different regions of Roman Gaul took at the fall of the Roman empire. But that's about it. What are you doing? I'm going to have a similarly uh, demanding data collecting thing coming up soon, I think. I'm not sure what it will turn into, if anything. But um, I became intrigued to look up uh, fouls and whether like elite fighters foul more than fighters who are not elite. So... Uh, who, or who are at least not at the top of their division. So I decided to go with, I'm going to pick a division and basically look at the last three to five fights of each of the guys in the top 10 and then do the same for the guys who are ranked 40 through 50. And I may come up with something interesting. It'll take a lot of time, but uh, it should be fun in the meantime. Other than that, videos for Ward Kovalev in the works, uh, video breakdowns for that fight because I'm so excited about it. I want to probably do a few on each of the guys and then maybe one on the matchup itself. And... Um, more stuff on bare knuckle boxing. I enjoyed doing that article the other week, so I'm going to have a piece on uh, bare knuckle technique and how it might differ and how it did differ when bare knuckle boxing was still a, a mainstream sport of its kind. And I think that's about it for me for now. But uh, anyway, that's about it. Way to have a show peter out, right, Pat? It's always good to have that uh, that slow decrescendo down to the final song. <clears throat> Oh, God. Well, on that note. (laughs) Uh, Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Find us on social media if you want to get at us. At Patrick underscore Wyman is my co-host here. I am at Boxing Bush. That's B-U-S-C-H. You can find our episodes every Wednesday on Bloody Elbow. Whatever random stuff you want to know, get at us if you have any questions. And thank you for listening. If you came here today for the finer points of face punching, came to the right place. This has been Heavy Hands. (laughs) 